Once upon a time... Wait, what in the world is that? Look over there, you guys. Oh my god, is that a fire-breathing dragon? Don't panic, though, because our manga's main character is here to save the day. It's obvious he's the MC because he looks like the most generic-looking character ever. Anyway, our boy unleashes a cunning sneak attack on the dragon's legs to immobilize its movement. And it doesn't do jack. Just when I'm on the edge of my seat thinking this might end up as a one-shot manga, the dragon slips and isekais itself with a self-chiropractic adjustment. After cautiously poking at it to make sure it really is gone, our boy lets out a manly battle cry, bestowing himself as the greatest warrior in the kingdom. He opens up the IKEA instruction manual to see what the manga's next plot is. It says that once you slay the dragon, the next step is to ascend a tower where a beautiful princess lies under a curse, awaiting a kiss from her betrothed to break the spell. Oh, f yeah, I'm ready for step number two, all right our boy heroically thinks to himself. But only because the princess, no, the entire kingdom, needs him. His intentions are nothing but noble. Hold up, though. Just how many princesses are there? More importantly, how did they even manage to get this mattress up that tiny-ass stairway? Of all the insightful things the author can tell us at this point, like maybe the main character's name, we're instead informed that there's a lot of them. Anyway, which one is the princess? Are all seven of them princesses? Maybe he should start with one. So our boy picks his favorite one and awakens her with a magical kiss. Her eyes open, emitting a crusty noise from all those years of sleep. Her name is Claire and she apparently likes vanilla ice cream. But it's going to be hard enough memorizing all seven of their names for this recap so you don't have to remember what her favorite food is. Anyway, our boy politely greets her like a courteous G. But Claire yeets her rotten pillow at his face. Then she grabs the fruit bowl that somehow has fresh-looking fruits and screams that boys aren't allowed in her room. In response, our boy insists he's not suspicious, which is the first thing a suspicious person would say. So she hurls the fruit bowl at his cheeks. It misses and hits his face instead. Claire then tries to alert everyone else, all of them still lying asleep. To roughly translate our boy's Shakespearean speech, what he's saying is, Calm down, bitch, I'm here to save you. And finally, the author reveals his name to be Alec. At last, Claire looks chill, so Alec begins to explain the manga's background. She's been asleep for more than 30 years, placed under a witch's curse. And there was a fire-breathing dragon that stood guard outside the castle. But she ain't gotta worry about that because he defeated the vicious dragon all by himself with his even more vicious ninja moves. So the curse has been undone, and all the side characters in the kingdom will also gain their lives back. Not to brag, but it's all thanks to his bravery, heroism, selflessness, greatness, and every other synonym you can find in the thesaurus related to those words. Alec thinks Claire is going to start simping over him, but she instead bursts out of the chamber. Is she upset that she's suddenly a middle-aged woman? Alec tries to catch up to her, but struggles to, because her middle-aged legs are surprisingly swift. Upon opening the door to the throne room, Claire discovers her parents asleep. And so is everybody else in the castle. Catching his breath, Alec thinks he's going to need to recite another Shakespearean poetry to calm her down. But to his surprise, she looks rather happy. Oh my god, it's just like in the fairy tales, Claire marvels out loud. On a side note, though, imagine the neck pain this man is going to experience when he wakes up. Anyway, that wasn't very princess-like of her, so Claire apologizes to Alec. Getting back to business... Alec inquires if the other girls in Claire's room are also princesses. Indeed, Claire reveals that all seven of them are sisters. Apparently, their father wanted a male heir and didn't know when to give up. Not until he hit seven, at least, and fell into a depression. Anyway, Alec starts drooling at the anticipation of waking the rest of her sisters, but only to break the curse, of course. On their way back up to the room, Claire asks why Alec decided to wake her up first. And how did he do it? Is he perhaps a wizard? Alec isn't about to expose himself as to how he woke her up, so he screams in bolded letters that wizards aren't allowed to use magic in the presence of muggles and shuts the door on her. That was a close call. I mean, she threw a fruit bowl at his face from being startled, so imagine what she'd do to you if she found out the truth behind how he actually lifted the curse. Anyway, there's six more to go. While he'd like to take his sweet time lifting the curse with each one, 
starting from his second favorite to the least, they're going to wake up too fast, so that's off the table. Hence, Alex speed runs through all six to awaken them all at the same time. Did he manage to pull it off? There seems to be a commotion inside the room. It looks like Charlotte, who likes strawberries, bitch slapped Alec. She begins accusing him of being suspicious. So Claire rushes in to defend him, explaining to her younger sister that he's legit a wizard who's come to save them. Charlotte doesn't bother apologizing for her rude mistake, though. She instead asks why her sister is walking around outside in her pajamas. When she finally does address Alec, she starts treating him like a Baruto fan. Outside the castle, Alec treats us to a little flashback. He reminisces about his mother, who, uh... Oh, yeah. What was I saying? Actually, you know what, guys? Why don't you read the speech bubbles yourselves because I'm busy clenching my teeth? She offers to read her son a book about the tale of the sleeping princess to help him fall asleep. The mother probably had no intent of finishing the book, but little Alex stays awake through the entire story. He expresses a concern about the citizens of Amaryllis and inquires whether they are still asleep. His mom says they probably are still under the spell of the witch, a spell she'd like to use on her son because the mother just won't sleep. Now, little Alec begins to cry upon hearing their wretched fate. But soon after, he gets an audacious idea. What if he were to defeat the dragon and break the curse? His mom holds in her laughter and says, sure you will. Fast forward 10 years, Alec's mom becomes the star of a manga called That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Tombstone. Meanwhile, an elderly side character comes along to alert Alec that his father is looking for him. And that's the last we'll ever see of him. As it turns out, Alec is a princeling himself. His father, the king, voices his concern about Alec embarking on a solo quest to slay the dragon. Alec reaffirms his commitment while his brothers cast doubt on his ability, claiming he'll never make it out alive. Finally, Alec's father caringly says, Well, whatever. But if you're gonna go, make sure you conquer that country. While Alec verbally agrees, he's actually lying. He has no interest in conquering another kingdom. His only ambitions are to lift the curse with that passionate tongue of his. We're back from the flashback, yet everyone still appears to be under the witch's curse. Alec goes back to the Ikea manual, thinking he must have missed something. That's when one of the princesses comes along and asks what's up. Her name is Kiara, and she happens to like raisins. And if you're wondering what that thing is around her neck, well, let me show you. It's chapstick. Alec gets all shy by Kiara's unexpected gesture. In turn, she gets a little closer and says that the next time they're alone, she'll tend to his other wounds. While our boy gets excited from planning to deliberately tumble down a flight of stairs to get bruises all over his body, here come the rest of the princesses. Out of all these girls, I still say Alec's mom is the best. Anyway, Claire finally introduces Alec as a prince of another kingdom. While Alec internally strategizes on winning the trust of all the princesses, let's learn the names of the rest of the princesses. We've met Claire already, the one Alec awakened first. There's Flora who's got a big heart, Mia with the teddy bear, Elisa with pigtails that could serve as handles if you're into motorcycles. There's also Euchre, whose name I'm not sure if the AI can say properly as I write this. Charlotte, who slapped our boy and looks similar to Yukar, but has her hair up in buns. And finally, Kiara, who applied chapstick on Alec earlier. Elisa jumps in with a question to ask about lunchtime. I forgot her name, but she urges that there are more pressing matters. However, Elisa don't give a f about anything else because she's hangry. Finally, Alec informs them that everyone is still asleep. Not just the kitchen staff, but Uber Eats delivery drivers as well. Hasn't the curse been lifted? What's going on? Alec claims he's followed the assembly instructions carefully, but something is not right. Something must be lacking. Putting that matter aside for now, Claire asks for his help in foraging for some food. Meanwhile, the sister whose name I forgot gets intrigued by the scroll in Alec's hands. He dismisses its importance, saying that it's merely an Ikea assembly instruction. That, however, makes her even more curious because there's no Ikea in her kingdom. So she tries to take a curious peek, but Alec deftly rolls it up to conceal its contents. As you might recall, 
The scroll contains the instructions for waking up the princesses, so that's why our boy looks all shook. Anyway, they ought to do some cleaning around the castle, but Elisa is at her limit and needs to fill her tummy first. So they all head to the kitchen where they find loads of food. It's been 30 years yet somehow, everything miraculously looks and smells fresh. Elisa takes a bite and oh my god, it's so yummy. Alec quietly lets her know that she's clumsily smeared food all over her face. Unaccustomed to such peasantry tasks from a life of privilege, Elisa requests Alec to clean her face for her. When he does, she doesn't let that cheesy goodness go to waste. Because who knows how long the kitchen ingredients are going to last. It looks like Alec's cheeks can't hide a single lie. Not wanting to be outdone by her little sister, the princess whose name I forgot decides to use her assets. By assets, I of course am referring to her skillful assets of finding food in weird places around the castle. Her name is Euchre, and she likes grilled fish and rice. Yukar finds it intriguing how all the food is still fresh. It's as if they too had fallen asleep along with the people in their kingdom. Meanwhile, our boy grinds his teeth because there's something else he finds intriguing, but he keeps that part to himself. As Yushar explores the thorny ivy enveloping the castle, she expresses fascination, having never witnessed anything beyond the castle walls. Raised under the shadow of the curse's prophecy, the princesses were confined within the castle and have never once stepped foot into the outside world. Euchre suddenly gets real close to Alec and examines his eye color with curiosity. She's never seen such a color. Alec wonders if she's ever seen the color light brown, which he happens to have in his possession, his leathery belt strap but he wisely keeps it to himself, at least for the time being. After finishing their meal, Alec and the seven girls decide to take a stroll outside. His favorite girl, Claire, decides to show him something cool. A beautiful, black and white garden within the castle ground. Claire says it's been a while since she's been to the garden. She and Euchre got caught sneaking metapods back to their rooms and hiding them under their bed, so they were banned from entering the garden. Enough of that backstory, though. Let's help Flora set up the picnic table. Flora seems to have a quiet and calm personality in contrast to Elisa, who's her polar opposite. Elisa doesn't have the patience to change, so she just dives right into the water. Apparently, she's never swam in her life, but somehow executed a perfect dive just moments ago. All the sisters rush into the water, but Yukar doesn't allow our boy Alec to join in on the fun. Just as he starts regretting waking her up, Alec notices someone balled up in the corner. Oh, it's just Mia, whose favorite food is salted. Yeah. Mia says she has no interest in swimming. She's a middle-aged woman, so she refuses to partake in such childish activities. Then suddenly, a ferocious butterfly lands on Mia's head, making her scream in extra-large-sized fonts. She orders Alec to get it off her head, and he does, with a gentle hoo of his breath. Mia hugs her lord and savior for heroically saving her from the vile butterfly. She then gets all shy and runs away, but slow enough that Alec can catch up to her. But he doesn't even bother, because a princess he prefers over Mia awaits him. This is Flora, the one with the biggest heart among the sisters. She's got a fondness for cheese and yogurt. Now I'm tempted to insert a wood joke here, but I got in trouble for it, so I'll defer it for another video. Anyway, she just took a yummy nap under the sun and suggests Alec should try it. In fact, why doesn't he put his head on her lap, right underneath that big heart of hers? And then, suddenly, the winds of demonetization from my recap video six months ago blow all the way to this scene. For having endangered this channel, Princess Flora issues an apology and promptly excuses herself. What a long day he's had. Well, actually, it's not over just yet. Here comes Claire from her swim, yet again jeopardizing this channel. So Alex swiftly provides her a blanket of ad suitability, under the guise of keeping her warm. Reflecting back on the past 30 years, which she remembers none of, Claire can't believe she's in her 40s now. Alex steers the conversation from her midlife crisis to the more pressing matter of waking everyone else up in the kingdom. Although she agrees they should, she finds the situation kind of exciting. It's almost as if they're the only ones left in this world. And by the way, how did he manage to defeat the dragon all by himself? 
Alec indulges in a self-aggrandizing rant about how he was born a hero and that with great power comes great responsibility. In essence, he insists that Claire doesn't need to thank him for being a hero. He's just being himself. That speech was so cool that Claire decides to pretend that a breeze was strong enough to push a grown-ass woman into the lake. Alec panics and jumps in right after her, despite knowing she can totally swim on her own. The Ikea manual also plaps in the water, but he's too focused on making sure she's all right. Fortunately, she seems to be all right, so Alec suggests they should head back to land. However, it looks like Claire might have different ideas for what's going to happen next. Meanwhile, her sisters are swimming around, wondering about Claire's whereabouts. The girl whose name I forgot again suspects Alec is up to no good, whereas Elisa disagrees. In fact, she thinks he's pretty cool. And here comes the Ikea manual coming to bump Charlotte's shoulder. Let's now go back to Alec and Claire to see what they are up to. Hold on a second. Are they about to get cultural? But just in the nick of time, the sisters show up to ruin it for us, cautioning Claire to get away from Alec. As Claire gets confused, Flora reveals the contents of the scroll. Kiara asks if he really committed step number two according to the instructions. Well, of course. I mean, what the f*** else was he supposed to do? Let them all sleep for eternity? Elisa starts shaming Alec and so do the others. They think he deserves to be isekai'd, but only because he vanquished the dragon. They'll let him live. Still, he's banished from their lands for all eternity. Having realized how filthy Alec is, Claire sheds fat tears down her cheeks. She then runs away, and the rest of the princesses chase after her. Meanwhile, Alec is gaslit into believing he really is a villain. However, he can't just leave now. The prophecy foretells an imminent attack on the country. That leaves him with just one option, and that's to turn the genre of this manga into a harem to earn their forgiveness. Of course, it's only to break the witch's curse. Man, what a mess. This is going to be much harder than slaying a dragon, Alec thinks to himself, as if he actually did anything himself to defeat the dragon. The next morning, our boy Alec attempts to catch a pigeon for breakfast, but he fails. With no food left and Uber Eats still unavailable, his hunger intensifies. But wait, what's that smell? It remains a mystery how Alec managed to smell the pot of soup all the way from outside, but anyway... Before he can consider taking some for takeout, the princesses arrive. Just where did our boy go? Here he is. He's feeling way more tense than when he battled the dragon. The girls begin talking about Claire, who hasn't eaten anything since the previous night and even refused to join them for breakfast. She must really be upset over Alec. Charlotte rages over Alec and his dirty tongue while Flora seems more understanding probably because she's got a big heart. Amidst the heated debate, here's Alec playing Twister under the table. Thankfully, everyone appears to be done eating and about to go do their own thing. Are they all gone? No, Elisa is still filming a mukbang by herself. But then she drops a cherry tomato, so she screams, Tomato! and goes to retrieve it from under the table. That's how she spots Alec underneath, so she screams, Ginya! Alec gets another scolding from Charlotte and the others. He gets on his knees to swear he's telling the truth, but Charlotte just yeets him out of the castle. And so, without even a spoonful of soup in his tummy, Alec's consciousness begins to fade from hunger. Meanwhile, the girls leave some food and tea outside the door for Claire. Upon hearing their footsteps disappear, Claire emerges to retrieve her room service. Just as she closes the door, however, there is a knock on the door. Alec desperately claims he's about to get Izakai'd, despite literally missing just two meals. But he's not here to steal her food or anything. He simply wants to offer a sincere apology. In the very next scene, Alec chows down all her food and licks the plate clean. Afterward, he tries to make an apology for his actions. Claire, however, says she and her sisters should be the ones thanking him for risking his life to save them because that was his only intention, right? Still, she can't forgive him for what he's done. If you're wondering what's going on, Claire devours romance books like how I devour an entire party-sized bag of flaming Hot Cheetos and cry myself to sleep after over the reckless amount of calories consumed. The point is, she wanted her first kiss to be special, but it happened while she was asleep, so that makes her really upset.
By the way, if she seems a little off to you, it's because the tea was infused with some courage by Elisa, and that's why Claire is acting this way. Anyway, she suggests they redo it right here and right now. Slurp. She falls asleep right afterwards, leaving Alec puzzled about where exactly he stands with her now. Has she forgiven him? He spends the entire day trying to figure it out, but simply can't make sense of anything. Finally, Claire wakes up to make an appearance. She acts all shy while offering an apology for her cultural behavior. In order to compensate, Claire says she'll help turn this manga into a proper harem. In response, Alec grabs her enthusiastically and thanks her, which Claire is totally into. Okay. Strategy meeting time. She wastes five minutes drawing her sister's faces instead of just writing their names down. And then, she thinks for a second about who they're going to aim for first, then points at Kiara, the girl who likes raisins and applied chapstick on Alec's lips. When he inquires why she chose Kiara first, Claire says she's pretty easygoing. In fact, she's never even seen Kiara angry before. Well, she's not his first choice, but she's definitely not on the bottom of his list, so Alec agrees. And you know what? She's probably gardening alone right now, so Claire suggests he should approach her there. Indeed, our raisin-loving Kiara appears to be playing Stardew Valley by herself. But how does he capture her attention without frightening her? It looks like he doesn't have to worry because she's already noticed his presence. And as Claire predicted, Kiara doesn't seem upset with him at all but rather delighted. She hands him a bag of herbs and invites him to follow her somewhere. After some time, they arrive at a bougie spa. This time, Kiara asks Alec for his help to dump the herb in the water, so he does. She begins suspecting that he's trying to earn her favor. His nose does seem awfully brown, as if it's been dipped in chocolate. Suddenly, they hear the approaching footsteps of the other princesses. Oops! Kiara says she forgot she had invited them to the spa. And oops again, the spa has only one door so he can't make an escape. Oh my god. He's in big trouble this time. He might actually get isekai'd. And if he does, he hopes it's at least somewhere cool. Not a place where he's gonna end up as Kirito's side bitch in Sword Art Online. Fortunately, Kiara and Alec manage to sneak away. Not outside, though, but into a private spa room. Why did she go out of her way to save him? Well, Alec, you're about to find out. Kiara salt bays the water with some herbs to the bath for Alec. He must have suffered a lot of injuries from battling the dragon, right? So this is a gesture to mark their friendship. Alec gets confused over what she means exactly. What she means is, take your f***ing top off because it's bath time, baby. That marks the end of chapter 3. There are 14 more chapters ahead, so if you'd like me to, I can do a part 2 recap covering up to the latest chapter. But since many of you liked and commented on my last video, I'll work on part 2 of that manga next. As always, thank you for watching my video. Love you guys. Bye.